Our scripture text for today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. <clears throat> In the time of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. So Zechariah was a priest. That was his job, his profession. Basically, his whole life centered around being a priest here in Jerusalem in the big temple. And in our text today, his priestly division is on duty. They took turns when they were stationed to help with worship, make sure all of the people who came to worship that day had everything that the worship service was ready. They did a lot of sacrifices back then, so they needed a lot of priests and worship leaders to help keep things going. The big temple in Jerusalem was always busy, and Zechariah's division is working that day. Now, in the center of the big temple was where they thought God's presence was the most focused. They called it the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. And in that room, only the priests were allowed to enter. And even then, only one at a time. They considered it such a holy room that they would often tie a rope around the priest's waist in case he happened to drop dead because he was in the very presence of the Lord and they could then drag the body out. So this was indeed a very big and charged room. There was an altar there in the most holy place. And according to the instructions in Exodus chapter 30, there was always supposed to be incense burning on that altar table morning and night to honor God. Only one priest was chosen each day to light the incense. It was a big, important job. And there was hundreds and hundreds of priests. So you only got to perform that honor maybe once in your whole career. Each day to determine who would do it, they would cast lots, it says. And that was like they would uh, roll out bones or rune stones and kind of read and see who the lots chose that day. A modern analogy might be like putting names in a hat. And we put a name in a hat and we draw it out to see who is chosen. And this day, Zechariah's name came up. He gets to go and burn the incense 
on the altar before God. A big once-in-a-lifetime job to do. Meanwhile, as he's getting ready and doing that, all the worshipers at the temple that day are outside in the worship area, praying during the service, waiting on Zechariah to do his part and come back out so that they can continue with their worship. And that's when Gabriel, the angel, shows up. So it does make me wonder a little bit about Gabriel. This is the most important day of Zechariah's career. This is the holiest room he could ever stand in. He's got the biggest job he could ever do. He is the most nervous and tense as he lights the very altar of God. And that's when Gabriel says, hey, Zechariah, I've got big news. I hope he didn't drop the incense for goodness sake, but I would understand if he did. Maybe Gabriel was just really excited to share this news or was making sure Zechariah was awake that day. When he finds out this awesome news that the thing he and his wife had been praying about for years was going to happen, it should be the biggest joy ever. The message is that God will use this son that Zechariah will have to do incredible things that will help people get ready to follow Jesus. So what were some of the things that it said in verses 16 through 17? It says that Zechariah's son, John the Baptist, he will bring people to God. He'll walk in spirit and in power. He'll help turn people's hearts towards righteousness. Then people will be ready, ready for Jesus, ready for Christmas, ready for what the Christ will do and say. Jesus' message will be so life-changing and life-giving that before people even hear it, God needs to send somebody else to prepare them. And that somebody is so impressive too, his parents have to get ready for him. So again, this should be the biggest moment of joy ever for Zechariah. First, he gets chosen to perform the holiest of priestly duties. Then he found out he'll have a baby. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And Zechariah can't believe it. He tells Gabriel to his face, I can't believe it. So Gabriel says, I'm an angel. What do you mean you don't believe it? I'll tell you what. You think about it quietly to yourself till the baby's born then see if you believe it. And boom, he couldn't talk for the next nine months. Couldn't make a peep until his son, John the Baptist, was born later on in this chapter. Zechariah's first words that day were praises to God. He was overwhelmed. How interesting that when Zechariah is surprised by this truly joyful message, he answers with disbelief, and he is made to be silent. In terms of reactions to surprises or shocking news, I'm kind of the opposite. When I get really surprised or I hear something that I wasn't expecting, my brain just freezes up and I'm so stunned I can't get any words out of my mouth. Maybe you're like that. Or maybe you're like Zechariah. Have you ever been in a a situation out in the world somewhere and somebody is just going off about some issue that they are so wildly misinformed about that you just can't believe a human adult would spout such nonsense? And what you want to say in response to them is to very calmly and firmly say, you know, what you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Now everyone in this room is dumber for having listened to it, right? That's what you want to say when you hear the craziest thing someone says to your face. But instead, all I can come up with is, uh, okay, 
And then, of course, 10 minutes later, I'm going, oh, I should have said that. I should have said that. I stun myself into silence. But Zechariah is the opposite. He can't help but shout it out and question an actual angel on the rationality and the probability of what was just said. So he handles surprises differently than I do. Maybe you react to surprises in yet another way, in a different way. Whatever the way is that you react to surprises and shocking news, it's hard not to do something silly or say something unhelpful in those situations while our brain is trying to catch up and process what we just heard and saw. I think the subtitle of the whole Christmas story in the Bible could be, surprise, God's doing something you didn't expect. And when Zechariah experiences it firsthand, he kind of talks himself into a corner, a very quiet, silent corner. So we don't want to make the same mistake. We don't want to be caught off guard like Zechariah when we see and hear what God is doing. And because we've got a little heads up, we can be a little more prepared. We've read the Christmas story before, so we know that God pops up at times and places that we don't expect. And the Holy Spirit will move and weave people into our lives that are surprising. Even if we don't know when or where it will happen, at least we can be ready to move when it does. <clears throat> it's kind of like an outfielder in a baseball game. They don't know when a hit will come near them or where it will go, but they still have to be ready with every single pitch. Now, does it get boring sometimes? Probably so, but you still got to be ready. I remember when our oldest son, Sean, was in kindergarten, we signed him up for T-ball, as, as you do, and it was always cute and sweet to see the little kindergartners out in the outfield. And of course, at that age, you don't have a lot of sluggers on your team. There's not some kindergartner who comes up and just points over the fences, you know, and just knocks it out of the park. So the outfield doesn't get a lot of action in kindergarten t-ball. So often the kids would get bored and they would just kind of look around at the birds and, and they'd throw the grass and they'd chat with each other and just stand and watch the dandelions grow there in right field. It was sweet and cute. Even Babe Ruth once said, it's lonesome in the outfield. It's hard to keep awake with nothing to do. So yeah. It can get slow, but that doesn't mean that you don't stay ready for anything, anytime. The pros will bend their knees and get kind of on the balls of their feet so that they're ready to go in any direction. You can't get distracted. You have to stay focused. That goes for playing baseball or just living your life, getting your work done, caring for your family, doing normal things you got to do. <clears throat> you never know what life will throw at you or when God will do something incredible. <clears throat> Although you can know during cold and flu season, you'll get a sore throat for about a solid month. Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, tis the season to have a constant sore throat, that's for sure. <clears throat> so, Zechariah's problem in our story was that he was not ready to be surprised and he wasn't expecting God to do anything. He was like an outfielder who never thought the ball would come to him. So when the ball finally does come to him and there's an angel right there telling him something incredible, he freaks out. <clears throat> and when our son was in kindergarten T-ball, that's what would happen to the outfielders, those rare times when a ball would make it that far, they didn't know what to do. And so they'd kind of run in circles like the Keystone cops banging into each other and falling down and fighting over the ball. And then somebody would get it and they'd be all excited, but they wouldn't know what to do with it. They'd give it around. They'd toss it over here. It was cute chaos. They panicked because they weren't ready. 
And even though you won't be playing outfield on a kindergarten t-ball team, do you ever feel like that is you during life circumstances? That you're just waiting around on humdrum days, maybe walking through life like a zombie, kind of half asleep because you're always tired, assuming nothing good or incredible will happen to you. And as soon as something different does start to happen that you weren't expecting, you kind of panic and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to respond and you shout out, that wasn't the plan. Or maybe that's just me. That's what I shout out. That wasn't on my schedule for the day. When we suddenly realize that life is coming at us like some pop fly ball in the sun, <clears throat> we'll usually kind of panic and, and move in different directions because we don't know what's good for us. We don't know what to do, so we don't make good choices. Instead of being calm, we freak out. So to avoid that, we need to be ready to move in whatever direction is helpful. <clears throat> so how do professional outfielders handle it? They say that in the outfield, it's just a fact that there might be a number of innings where you don't even touch the ball at all, <clears throat> where nothing's happening for you. So have you ever felt like that in life? Nothing's happening for you. Nothing's coming your way. You can't get anything going. Nothing's good. What's the point? <clears throat> That's why the pros say you have to maintain your focus in order to be a good outfielder. <clears throat> hey, I'm going to get through this sermon, I promise. <laughs> <clears throat> Should have had that extra cough drop this morning. It's because Bill Light is not here to give out his mints this morning. That's why. <clears throat> so what the major league outfielders say, they have a routine for every game. It keeps their mind from wandering and it helps them stay alert. <clears throat> so first, before the game starts, they imagine themselves making every play possible in that game, whether it's a grounder or a pop fly, stretching over the fence to make an amazing catch, throwing a runner out at first, second, third. They visualize everything, what it'll look like, what's involved, how they will respond. <clears throat> so when you go out and you take the field, you plan to make good plays that day in baseball and in life. Before you leave your house, maybe you're still in bed or in the shower eating breakfast. <coughs> maybe you're in the car driving to work. Visualize everything that could come at you that day and figure out how to respond to it responsibly. <coughs> Then when you step out of your house or out of your car, expect things to happen and expect God to be at work. <clears throat> when each batter comes up, the professionals think about what's happening. How many outs are there? How many runs? What does this batter do? What's their record? <clears throat> they don't know exactly what will happen, but they, they have an idea what might happen. <clears throat> So they're ready to move. They're thinking and planning and ready to respond at all times, ready for anything. Zechariah seemed like he wanted to call a timeout. Don't, June's bringing me a cough drop. Uh, it's from Cash. Thank you so much. To uh, r relieve all the tor torture of the people listening to me. Call. <clears throat> yes, Patty, please tell Bill that we missed him today and his mints. <clears throat> so what did Zechariah want to do? He wanted to call a timeout, go to the pitcher's mound, talk about strategy. What's going on here? What's this play about? <clears throat> what are we going to do? He says, wait a second. You can't be serious. That's impossible. <clears throat> but when life starts throwing things at you, you don't always have time to call a timeout, go to the pitcher's mound, and talk strategy. You got to move when the action starts. 
So I encourage you to come up with a routine each day. Think about what each day will involve. Who will you see? Where will you go? What will you do? And how can you, <clears throat> how can you be a godly presence that day in every situation? You don't know what will come at you, but you can be ready to move whatever it is. God has planted you here and has put you in a spot. So you got to be ready to respond for whatever happens. And if you're having trouble seeing or hearing what God is up to, then maybe like Zechariah, you might need to take a while to be quiet and to be silent so that you can hear God coaching you from the dugout because the Spirit of God is definitely at work in the world. And the only question is, will you be ready to move when you get the opportunity? Let's pray. <clears throat> oh God, we confess that we don't take surprises very well. We can get thrown off when life throws unexpected curveballs at us. So help us to be ready to move when you need us to work. In your name we pray. Amen.